Grace and peace to you. I'm Todd Townsend, Bishop of Huron, and then we're coming into the third week of Easter. This week I wanted to simply go to Luke's Gospel, which is uh, the end of which is chapter 4, and go through a story that is so familiar to, to some of us. It's become a pattern for the passage to faith, uh, that it is one of those stories that you just walk through and try to let it speak to you about the time you're in today. So that's what we'll do with the story, The Road to Emmaus. This story is the second part of this last chapter in Luke's Gospel. The first part of this chapter begins, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb with the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, and they did not find the body. That's the Easter story in Luke's Gospel. And after they do not find the body, they set out in their life again. Uh, and what we see in the season of Easter is how Jesus comes alongside as the risen one and makes all the difference. There's uh, many really important words in Luke and Acts that we believe are written by the same author. Two of these words you'll find in here, and they are um, along the way, hodos, I think is the Greek word, and makron, far off. So in these stories, it means something when, it's, when something's happening along the way, along the road to something. Uh, God works in those situations when you're not quite where you're going and you aren't where you were before. And far off, that the, uh, there's a lot of concern for the people who are far away, far off, away from us, at a distance. And you hear some echoes in this story. This is a story that reveals a pattern uh, in the Easter life, the resurrection life. And it begins like this. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to the village Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. These are two people who had come from Emmaus, that's their home, to Jerusalem, and they had found Jesus. They'd found a life with this person sent from God that was uh, wonderful and beautiful and hopeful and which at this point in the story had been taken away. And they were going back home. They're going back to where they were before um, and as we'll see, feeling a particular way. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And they said to them, he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along the road? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? It's a remarkable moment on the same day that Jesus was raised from the dead that these two were walking home uh, sad, deeply sad about what had happened, about all that had been taken away, about all that had changed. But they didn't know what had happened earlier that day. We don't always know what God's been up to earlier in the day. And what God had been up to is he raised Jesus from the dead and for some reason sent him and he went and wanted to go alongside them and ask him this very gentle question. What are you doing? How are you feeling? Are you okay? And they came back and said, are you a fool? Don't you know what happened? Don't you know everything that's been lost? Don't you know what things he says? Well, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before the people and God, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned and crucified him to death. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it's the third day since these things taken place. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any end to it. It doesn't look like there's any going back. But God in the risen one has come alongside them. They just don't recognize that yet. They can't see it yet. And they're still very deeply in their sadness. So what Jesus does as they go along the way home, they, if they go back to that place where before they had faith, uh, the place where they think they have comfort, he comes alongside to them and interprets to them, helps them to understand all that has happened. And they can hear it. 
but they don't really understand it and they certainly don't recognize the significance of it. But there's something about that conversation along the way uh, that makes them, by the time they get to Emmaus, listening to this stranger uh, who they don't recognize, they get to the point where they're at their home and their, their journey home is over. They're going to go inside their home, but they don't want him to keep going. He looks like he's just going to keep going, say, hello, nice, nice to talk to you. Something about this person they're engaging with made them want to say, come inside. Come inside my home where I'm going to be for this while. Uh, please stay with us. That was the hospitable thing to do. That might even have been a duty for them to, to say this to a stranger. But there was something more than that. There was an opportunity to have this person, this presence, come into our home with us. And he does. And what he does when he gets inside their home is kind of odd thing to do in that culture. Uh, they are the host. The people inviting him into the home are the host. He sits down at table with them to eat, to accept their hospitality, and takes on the role of host. He takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. And in that moment, they recognize who this host is. This is the host of the whole universe. This is the one who bears the wounds. This is the one who had been raised up from the dead earlier that day. And their eyes are opened by faith. Their eyes are opened in a pattern that was familiar but completely new. And they recognized him. That would have been a great ending to the story in some ways. We lost our Jesus. He came along. We didn't know who it was. We got him in our home, right where we need him. And he is with us. We have him back. But he vanishes as soon as they recognize him. This is one of the features that can be very frustrating about um, a life of faith. You think you've got it. You've got a hold of it. And it vanishes on you. And in the absence, in the emptiness of what you just realize you had, realize what was given to you and shared with you, you're asked to go and tell. Go and do something in this person's name. Like Mary and Easter, don't, don't cling to this. Just let it propel you into this future that we've been given. And what do they do? They head back to Jerusalem, that place of faith, to tell others what has happened. And they realize that there weren't our hearts burning within us when he was engaging with us along the way, when we didn't even know who he was. There was something beautiful and holy about that, but we didn't know what it was. And now we do. So we are going to run back and tell all the people in Jerusalem who have lost so much like us. They get back to Jerusalem, and what happens? They say, we have seen the Lord, and they basically say, we have too, in our own way, when they regather in that place of faith. It's such a beautiful story, and it takes on new meaning every time it's told. Every time I read it or hear someone talking about it, it is the pattern of our Eucharistic life in some ways, which we are deprived from in, a, in, the, in any way of gathering right now. But there is that sending out and doing things in the name of this risen one that we continue to do. We continue to do in such a beautiful way. I am so appreciative. I am uh, so thankful uh, for the things that people are doing right now in these limited circumstances. I'm so grateful for the people who are tending to the ones who are really vulnerable, the ones who are really dying, the ones who are really afraid or really sad. We continue to do that knowing that we've been propelled already before this and after it to tell the good news that God is with us in this new way, that there's a new creation, there's a future that belongs to God, and we are invited to be part of it. We're invited to be heralds of it, witnesses to it, participants in it, the people who enjoy it and share it with others. There's a colic that goes with this Sunday that can end this time in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, grant to your church the unity and peace that we taste in the life in Christ. Be with us in our brokenness. Be with us in our love and sharing. Be with us now and always. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Have a great week.